Since the 1960s, there have been significant changes to Army aviation. Equipment, tactics, and doctrine have changed, resulting in superior mobility and superior lethality capabilities. With these large changes came smaller, though no less significant changes. Feedback and suggestions from aircrew members coupled with combat experience help aid research and development teams in designing a better flight helmet. Changes to communications equipment, retention system, and a lighter, tougher, more resilient shell helped produce a flight helmet that was lighter and more comfortable to wear a factor that is key when wearing a flight helmet on missions that can last anywhere from 4 to 13 hours. I would definitely use uh, the new helmet uh, right here. This is the most modern high-speed version of it. And I love it. It's a good, good helmet. Mm -hmm. The HGU-56P Aircrew Integrated Helmet System has been the mainstay of Army aviation since its introduction in 1995. With several new innovative features not found on previous aircrew helmets, the HGU-56P has proven to be a reliable and effective aircrew helmet that provides better crash protection, greater comfort for the wearer, and better communications in a high noise environment. Developed specifically to meet the needs of Army aviation, the HGU-56P was a break from previous flight helmets that were adopted from the Navy and modified for Army use. Incorporating lessons learned from previous models, safety and survivability were key factors in the development. However, physical comfort for the wearer forced developers to rethink the role of the flight helmet. First thing when we saw the new helmet, it was very impressive. It was bigger. Uh, we're still thinking about the Darth, Darth Vader and Star Wars the, uh, era. Uh, we saw that shape of that, we thought, oh my god, we're going to look like Darth Vader's. But uh, actually, once we put it on, and, uh, I felt how, how comfortable it was and lightweight compared with this one. It's a big change. We, uh, everybody embraced, embraced the change with no problem. In 1984, the U.S. Army's Aeromedical Research Laboratory released a report which evaluated the performance of flight helmets in a crash sequence. The research did not include helmets damaged as a result of combat operations. This indicates that designers considered the crash sequence to be the greatest danger to aircrew members rather than hostile fire. The majority of the helmets tested were the third model flight helmet adopted by the Army, though a small number of first model helmets were analyzed. On arrival, each candidate receives an APH-5 flight helmet. He knows it will be weeks before he can wear it for real, but it's nice to look forward to. This first model flight helmet, officially adopted by the Army in 1958, was the first flight helmet for use by aircrew members. Designated the Aviator Protective Helmet No. 5, or APH-5 as it is commonly called, this Navy-designed helmet had been worn unofficially by some Army pilots since 1954. Capable of absorbing crash impact forces and provide head protection in an aircraft crash, it also boasted Army-specific communications equipment. A single visor provided eye and upper facial protection, as well as protection for the forehead and front part of the skull, an area prone to an injury in an aircraft crash. In 1962, the Army began developing an improved version of the APH-5. Combat experience in Vietnam led the Army to develop a flight helmet with better ballistic protection. Introduced in 1965, the new Anti-Fragmentation Flight Helmet, or AFH-1, was fielded. While providing better ballistic protection, the AFH-1 suffered from a major drawback, weight. Weighing roughly a pound and a half heavier than the APH-5, it was unpopular with aircrew members and was often shunned in favor of the lighter, though less protective, APH-5. Despite the weight advantage the APH-5 had over the AFH-1, it too suffered from deficiencies that would eventually lead to it being replaced. Aircrew members complained that it was too hot, too tight, and most importantly, too heavy. However, the Army determined the APH-5 provided inadequate hearing protection and cited that as the main reason for seeking a replacement flight helmet. In the mid-1960s, the Army began searching for a replacement helmet. Once again, the Army turned to the Navy. 
The Navy's Sound Protective Helmet Model 3 boasted significant improvements over the APH-5 in nearly every design feature and was adopted by the Army with little modification and redesignated Sound Protective Helmet Model 4, or SPH-4. As aircraft design and mission requirements changed, the severity of helicopter crashes increased, resulting in increased head injury. It was found that two preventable major head injuries were occurring, concussions and basilar skull fractures. To reduce the occurrence of concussions, the thickness of the energy-absorbing foam liner increased from 0.38 inches to 1 half inches. While the thickness was increased, the density of the EAL was decreased by 45%. This reduction of density enabled the EAL to compress more easily, allowing it to absorb more impact forces. In the mid-1970s, the cause of basilar skull fractures was traced to the rigid ear cup design, which could withstand a 5,000-pound load without failing. However, this area of the human skull will fracture under loads half as great. Unfortunately, it would not be until the late 1980s before an improved ear cup would be introduced. The single greatest improvement to the chin strap was moving the attachment point from the helmet shell to the retention assembly. Continued testing and research revealed that failure of the chin strap was the major cause of helmet loss in an aircraft crash. To remedy the chin strap failure, a double snap system replaced the single snap chin strap in 1978. Further refinement of the chin strap came in 1980. One side of the chin strap retained the double snap feature, while the other side was fastened with a screw and T-nut. Departing from previous flight helmet designs, the SPH-4 had an improved suspension system. Consisting of a leather headband with three intersecting crown straps, the new sling suspension system provided a more comfortable fit. These modifications resulted in a superior flight helmet that provided increased hearing and impact protection. However, researchers and designers did not stop with these improvements, and in 1989, the SPH-4 Bravo was introduced. The sling suspension system was replaced by a new thermoplastic liner. Introduction of the TPL had a significant effect on impact protection. Removal of the sling suspension allowed for a 25% thicker energy absorbing liner that provided a 20% increase in head coverage. Important to the aircrew member was the comfort provided by the TPL. Primarily designed as a more comfortable alternative to the sling suspension, the TPL is essentially a custom fitted pad. This custom fit allows for the helmet to be worn longer with less fatigue. The helmet retention system received improvements also. The double snap chin strap was replaced with a tab type D-ring system similar to a motorcycle helmet, necessitating a change in chin strap design. A new chin strap yoke was introduced that was sewn directly to the retention assembly and secured to the helmet shell with four grommets. The improved SPH-4 Bravo weighed 2.8 pounds, as compared to 3.3 pounds of the previous flight helmet. Aircrew members noticed the improved comfort of the SPH-4 Bravo due mostly to the reduced weight and improved retention system. As practical and functional as the SPH-4 Bravo was, its maximum potential as a flight helmet had been reached. Having used helmets designed by the Navy, the Army was limited to Navy design criteria. A helmet built to Army specifications was needed. The Army Air Helicopter Crew, the 56 is, I think, you know, the right helmet for the job, I think. In addition to better impact protection, the specifications included provisions for helmet-mounted devices greater hearing protection, and an increase in available helmet sizes. Overcoming the limitation of two helmet shell sizes, the HGU-56P helmet shell comes in four sizes. Six sizes are realized through the use of varying energy-absorbing liner thicknesses. The HGU-56P helmet shell utilizes a hybrid construction of graphite and Spectra 1000 embedded in an epoxy resin to meet impact resistance design criteria. The helmet shell distributes impact loads over a greater surface area while resisting penetration from rigid contact surfaces. You know, as far as crash worthiness and everything goes, it's, it's a good helmet, I think. And then compared to SP4, it's, it's a echelon's better than that helmet was. 
I think I feel a little more protected with this one just because it feels more like a motorcycle helmet does. You know, I feel like if uh, um, it, this could sustain a trauma a little bit better. I can't fly without the CEPs. Um, it became something I can't even fly without. I, you don't hear very clearly. It's just, it puts the voice right there inside your ear. It's clear. It's also two forms of hearing protection. Improvements for hearing protection came in the form of CEPs, communications earplugs. An aftermarket item that replaced foam earplugs, CEPs incorporate a small speaker inside an earplug. Hardwired to the flight helmet's communication system, CEPs provide better sound clarity over the standard speaker mounted in the flight helmet. With the CEPs, they get rid of a lot of the background noise on, on the aircraft, so I, I think that's a big improvement. Plus, I, I'm able to, uh, because the CEP is in my ear, ear canal, um, I, I'm able to pick up radio calls and, and the uh, um, intercom way better than with just the ear cuffs, where the ear cuffs are just um, cranking the volume up on them even higher to catch those calls without them being more hearing damage between the outside and ambient noise of the aircraft and then having to crank my ear cuffs up, where at least here I can keep it at a, at a normal, normal level. The addition of a face shield provides further protection for aircrew members. Specifically designed to defend against flying debris common to a helicopter environment, the face shield has the added benefit of providing clearer communications. When I was in uh, Iraq with the medic, and they'd be out there talking with the patients or loading a patient, you could hear what they're saying over the rotor wash of the aircraft, so it definitely helps keep the wind out. It's good for communications, and for the guys out there, when it's cold, that even, that, even that, that warm breathing within the helm, it helps them a lot to keep them warm. So I think, I think it's an improvement for them. In addition to cutting down on wind noise and helping to keep air crew members warm, it also defends against possible infection. I was in the medevac with the medics where they had somebody who was bleeding out. And there was blood everywhere. And, you know, in Iraq, you don't know what anybody's got. We were medevac in more local nationals than we were Americans. And God knows they've got hepatitis or whatever. You don't want to get that stuff in your mouth. So it was protecting them in the way that a, that a surgical mask would. They'd wear a surgical mask on it. The face shield is not the only helmet mounted device for the HGU-56P. The most common item mounted on the flight helmet are night vision goggles, or NVGs, which allow aircrew members to see at night. While NVGs can become heavy and tiresome after prolonged wearing, the benefit of being able to see in the dark outweighs these comfort issues. The, the weight of this thing is what was, you know, even with a weight bag, now you're just, just having the all that extra unslung weight on your head and just uh, really kind of get aggravating, and especially when you hook the umbilical for the hood on something while you're trying to turn, you know, and you know, they snag it on a, on your seat or something. So uh, um, once again, you know, if you fly with it on a regular basis, you get used to it and you figure out little tricks to avoid, you know, those problems. So the problem, I think, the problem with the helmets and the goggle system is that the weight of the of the actual goggles. Um, that right now, up to, up to now, we still have to use the weight to put on the back of the helmet. Since it's an add-on to, uh, add equipment to the helmet, you will have to do that unless they finalize and put everything within the helmet, which I think in the future I see it happening, that you will have to be able to have everything in the, in the helmet and make it, make it balance. So you have to do that. Um, I, don't, I didn't see any problems with it. Over the last 50 odd years, the flight helmet has come full circle. Initially, the Army wanted a flight helmet that would protect the wearer's head in the event of an aircraft crash. Through trial and error, it was determined that sound protection was important, and the Army sought a flight helmet that would protect the aircrew member's hearing. Once that was achieved, the Army again placed emphasis on protecting the wearer's head in the event of an aircraft crash. Unsurpassed in impact protection, communications abilities, hearing protection, and comfort, the HGU-56P is the pinnacle of flight helmet technology and will continue to serve well into the 21st century.